it would actually be cheaper to send everyone on Rikers to an Ivy League university than it would be to, to keep them locked up. 80% of the folks who are in Rikers are simply waiting to have their case heard. People do not believe that New York City is actually one of the safest big cities in this country right now. When we lock more people up, they go to Rikers. This is all of us. And the more we isolate it uh, as us versus them, you know, it's us today it's, and we're them tomorrow. Coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Why is it so hard to close a jail even when almost everyone agrees it should be closed? Prisons are bad enough, but jails typically house people who have not yet been convicted of any crime. Rikers, which includes 10 jails on an island in the Bronx of New York, currently has over 6,000 inmates, many more than it should, the majority of whom are there awaiting trial simply because they can't afford bail. Overcrowded, overwhelmed, the place is both a symbol and a symptom of our current approach to crime and safety. It's rife with dis dysfunction, delays, violence, lack of care, lack of justice. In October 2019, the New York City Council passed and then Mayor Bill de Blasio signed into law a plan to permanently close Rikers and create four neighborhood facilities instead. It was all scheduled to be done by August 2027, but it has run up against massive roadblocks. They come from the left, from the right, from the prison guards unions, and from the people who live in the neighborhoods where the new jails would be built. In many in many ways, the entire story shows just how hard it is to shrink the incarceration system once it has grown this large in such an unequal place. What could break the logjam? Our guests are New York City journalist Nick Pinto, co-founder of Hellgate, a worker-owned news outlet covering New York City. Nick's been writing about Rikers for years. And with us, to New York City public advocate Jimani D. Williams. As city council member, he helped pass the law to close Rikers. Elected public advocate in 2019, now he is the prime sponsor of legislation that would ban solitary confinement in the city's jails. Welcome, both of you. Um, I don't know where to start, but I think I'll start with you, public advocate Williams. You have actually visited Rikers. You've been inside probably more than once. Can you describe for us what you saw there? You know, I visited Rikers several times. I will say, uh, I believe it was the end of uh, 2021 uh, that was a, a time I visited with some folks. And I have to tell you, if I, I visited after that, but that, I do that, I say that one in particular because if I was told about what I saw, I would not have believed the people who told me. It was that much of a nightmare. It was a fully dysfunctional jail we saw people in 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 um jails and in, in, in cells that were supposed to house two three people maybe seven or eight they had plastic bags uh, using as bathrooms uh, we saw one person who had been in the shower uh, i was told for over 24 hours in a shower cell uh, in a shower stall i didn't know if he was wet with urine or with water um literally had uh detainees who were out of their cells just walking around um, it was filthy. It was, it was a, just a complete disaster. And I said, then it, it happened to be on our anniversary of Attica. And I said, and then the mayor got mad at me, but it was true. I was like, we are just an incident away from that. That's how insane and how bad it was for everyone involved. I can't tell you how bad what we saw was. Attica was the uprising by inmates in an upstate prison about prison conditions there over 50 years ago, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I was horrified, terrified. It is still currently a dangerous place for people to be. Uh, and that's for folks who work there and folks who are housed there. Uh, that's why we need to shut it down and we need to make sure that we don't take the culture that's there um, to the new bar based jails. Okay, so let's just underscore this. It needs to be shut down. There was a law passed declaring it to be on a schedule to be shut down. Then what happened, Nick? Why are we where we are today? As you alluded to in your introduction, there are um, 
a number of a number of groups of people who who actually don't like the plan to close Rikers and replace it with borough-based jails. One of those groups um, are are jail and prison abolitionists who who look at a plan to to build new, fresh, uh, uh, you know, carceral structures where where people will be held in detention by many of the same people who are currently holding them on Rikers and say, why would we refresh this institution? With new buildings that will last another hundred years, let's let's close Rikers and not build new jails. Another set of opposition comes from people who own property or businesses in the immediate vicinity um, of where the new smaller borough-based jails are proposed, who are worried about their their uh, their real estate values, basically. Um, and then I think most significantly uh, there is um, the the constellation of guards unions who uh, recognize that closing Rikers and replacing them with smaller borough-based borough jails involves dramatically reducing the jail population, uh, which in turn means shrinking their membership and, and their power. And uh, they're uh, opposed to, to closing Rikers for that reason, and they have powerful allies in City Hall right now. Um, which is to say they're big backers of the current mayor, Mayor Adam, Eric Adams. That is the case. Where do you stand on those neighbor on the neighborhood jail plan, PA Williams? It's not, you know, it's it's not something that I would say I uh, wholeheartedly. Oh, this is great. We're going to do this, but this is something we have to do, and this is now the law. So we have to move forward, out of sight, out of mind. Um, and the Rikers Island has been out of sight for such a long time. I think that's part of the reason uh, that we allow people to languish there. And I think as leaders, if we would take the time um, to have a conversation instead of trying to fit the 30 second soundbite, public safety doesn't fit in within 30 seconds, uh, take the time to walk New Yorkers through a plan uh, that will help keep them safe. They are ready for that. And closing Rikers and moving forward with the law is part of that. There were 19 deaths last year, I think matching a uh, historic high, one already this year. There have been many other stories um, that have hit the headlines over the years. Is there one that stands out to you, one perhaps that, I don't know, propelled you into your work on this issue? You know, when it comes to solitary, uh, Lelaine Polanco's uh, name uh, comes up uh, very often when it comes to bail reform, uh, um, a, a, um, a Browder, uh, Khalif Brown is the name that comes up a lot, but I guess what I want to say is that um, I don't think any of the people who died, and, and I may be incorrect, was serving time. I believe most folks were waiting to have their cases heard. That's something that we have to always reiterate. 80% of the folks who are in Rikers are simply waiting to have their case heard. And I believe it's something about 50 or more percent actually uh, dealing with mental health issues. Rikers Island is the largest mental health institution in North America. And so we are talking about folks that don't necessarily need to be housed in a jail like that uh, while they're waiting for uh, their uh, day in court. And I also always mention, we should all be on the same page trying to push for speedy trial. But the fact that people have to wait on their one, two, three years uh, makes absolutely no sense at all. Why is Ending solitary in city jail is so important. Solitary is uh, is torture. It really is. Uh, sitting by yourself in a small cell is torture. And as I said, uh, so many of the folks on Rikers uh, are dealing with mental health issues. It's torturous for someone who goes goes in there without mental health issues. Can you imagine if you have them and you're sitting in solitary? And it does not make anyone safer. When people ask me to describe my time in solitary confinement, the only word I can use is torture. Yeah. And I was also there as a detainee. I wasn't yes. found guilty of anything. I was there waiting a speedy trial, a speedy trial. For three years, 27 months of solitary confinement for them to tell me, you know what? Oops, not guilty, go home. There's harm to people, and then to be crass about it, there's also harm to city budgets. I mean, when the city has to pay out for offenses by um, officials or the staff or the guards, who actually has to pay the money? Uh, Nick, where does that money come from? That, that comes out of city funds, uh, you know, paid by taxpayers. I, you know, it's, it's not just settlements that, that uh, 
we think of when we talk about those costs. It's also just incredibly expensive to lock people up on Rikers. It's, it's an oft-cited statistic that it, it would actually be cheaper to send everyone on Rikers to an Ivy League university than it would be to, to keep them locked up. A lot of the discussion these days is about who is responsible and who could be responsible for closing Rikers and for this whole situation. Twelve years ago, in a federal government decision after a case brought by Rikers detainees and advocates, um, the violence there was deemed bad enough that it was a violation of the Constitution and a federal monitor was overseen to make sure that there were changes. Where does that stand today, Nick? The situation now is that um, that court continues to check in with the monitor several times a year, and, and there are public hearings where the monitor um, explains his his periodic reports and talks about the progress the city is making, uh, and very little else happens. Um, attorneys for the class of people who are held at Rikers in over the last year have been pushing the judge to... to uh, order a a um a takeover of of the jail system and take it out of uh New York City's control and the judge is very reluctant to do that there there is some there's some federal law that makes it difficult for her to do it and i think also it's 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 not a problem that she wants to go out of her way to to own uh on her own in any case do you think the situation would be better if it was taken out of city hands there are some technical reasons to think that it might be. One is that a lot of the um, a lot of what holds the situation uh, locked into its current position are are union contracts and and even um, employment law um, that that give the guards enormous leeway and make it very difficult for the city to um, uh, change how they do their business. Um, and uh, a federal overseer for the courts would be able to cut, would be empowered to cut through those contracts and that law, which is another reason why the guards are are very opposed to it. it. It did look for a moment there as if we were making some progress. I mean, the population of people detained is going to have to shrink if they're going to fit into those neighborhood-based jails. The numbers were coming down a while ago. They now seem to be going back up. Do I have that right, Nick? Yeah, you do. The uh, the numbers went down. I think they were down in the in the three thousand range, right around. They they let a lot of people, a lot of vulnerable, sick, and elderly people out um, in the first flush of COVID, and that that was sort of the culmination of a long years long drawdown in in the population of Rikers, and since that time, the population has been going up, and and that's due to a lot of factors. Some of it has to do with the change of administration. I, I mentioned the new mayor. Um, a lot of it has to do with um, change in the political winds, I, I would say, and uh, uh, a backlash against the, the the sort of rollback of mass incarceration that was progressing um, several years ago. We, we now are seeing at the state level, even at the federal level, and certainly at the city level, um, a, a political coalition of um, Republican politicians and district attorneys and law enforcement who um, see, a, a, as well as uh, con conservative uh, news media, who who share a sense that there's something to be gained by um, portraying crime in the city as out of control and uh, and in suggesting that the only solution to that is to lock more people up. And when we lock more people up, they go to Rikers. I think people will be surprised when they hear that there's less people in there was less people in Rikers pre-pandemic. Everybody thinks that uh, the quote unquote lefties let everybody out and there's actually more people in there now. And also uh, to add to what Nick was saying, it's not just Republicans. Unfortunately, it's Democratic leaders who are using Republican light talking points because they are afraid of having a real conversation. This situation is not isolated to New York City. To what extent is this Rikers crisis reflective of a bigger national problem? Detention in this country is is in the main um, both broken and and inhumane, and um, and the systems that send people there uh, remain remain largely unfair and extremely racist. So, in that sense, Rikers is is sort of a microcosm of of larger issues with. How this country feels about mass incarceration, um, and and what it's willing to do and what it's not willing to do to step away from fifty years of mass incarceration. 
I sometimes think that we need not just an economic and political shift, we need a spiritual shift um, in our relation to one another. Obviously, in our relation to race and racism and gender and homophobia and misogyny, but sometimes just a connection. And much as I'm against more jails, P.A. Williams, I do think perhaps having them closer to more of us where we live would improve or increase at least our consciousness of what we're responsible for. I think I think that's a, that is correct, 100 percent correct. A, a part of it is. Sometimes people say they want to deal with a problem or fix it when they mean they don't want to see it. So when we don't want to see uh, the the buildings that people are housing, when we don't want to see homeless people, a lot of bad things happen because there are real decisions that have to be made on real human beings. And sometimes when it comes to uh, jail, we assume guilt for everyone that's there. Uh, and we assume, uh, you know, those folks over there as opposed to us all together. And so that spiritual thinking, I think, is important to remember this is this is all of us. And the more we isolate it uh, as us versus them, you know, it's us today it's, and we're them tomorrow. We just had Chuck D on this program not so long ago talking about the situation in the 70s and the 80s and the early 90s. It's not as if this has ever been an easy um, walk in the park to decrease incarceration or to shut down a jail. So in the years I've been doing this, this is the first time I've seen a pop a, a a population of folks uh, in the city and the state who are ready to receive a conversation that's holistic around public safety. And we're squandering it. People understand now what public safety is in a much better way. And so when people are afraid, if you feed that fear, the answer has been lock up as many black and brown people as humanly possible all the time. And now we're saying, let's just lock up the children of the people we locked up 20 years ago. Now, this is a national conversation, but we are all of us New Yorkers in this discussion right here. And our precious city is involved right now, is gripped by grief and outrage over something that happened in our subways. A young man, Jordan Neely, spent much of his young life houseless, performed on those subways, um, was killed by a fellow subway rider. Clearly, this was a man who needed help. Uh, to what extent is our conversation different today? And what kind of help do we need to bring to this city to improve safety and care for all? You know, Jordan spent time in hospitals, cycled out, spent time in Rikers Island, came out. He was failed uh, a lot of different ways. And we have been pushing for a long time, I actually put out a report on what we need to do and how we're doing in those areas uh, in the city around uh, mental health in particular. I mean, you have said we need to invest along with divesting from incarceration. We need to invest in other measures like what? We need to have uh, respite centers uh, and, and places where people can go uh, in immediate times to get the assistance. Respite centers, you don't need to have a doctor's note. You don't need to have a, um, a diagnosis. You can just go in and get the assistance that you need. We need to make sure that we're getting people into um, uh, housing that is uh, supportive uh, and has supportive measures there. We need to make sure there's a continuum of care. But we seem to get stuck at the immediacy of a tragedy uh, like Michelle Goa, a tragedy like uh, Jordan Neely, and we feed off of um, the emotions of that in a way that's not helpful and has not gotten us to where we need to go. And what we need is leaders who will stand up and say, no, this is the plan. This is what we're going to do. But I feel like most folks are trying to figure out how to win their next election as opposed to how to help New Yorkers. Well, there have been a lot of people elected on a criminal justice reform program, and successfully so. I'm thinking of Brandon Johnson in uh, Chicago. Uh, it's not an, a, a rare thing these days, even though you don't get a lot of attention to the details. But coming to you, Nick, do you agree that there is a roadmap for change, just a lack of political will? I, th I think that's right. I, I mean, there is literally a roadmap. There is a plan to close Rikers uh, th th that we are currently deviating from. Um, and so, yes, I think I think it is a question of political will, and I think the, the sort of education uh, that's necessary to bring to bring the voting public along with this sort of change um, is difficult, and it's and it's especially difficult in the face of a concerted fear mongering campaign 
Well, that takes me to the media piece. I mean, you talked about an argument. An argument has to be carried somehow. Politicians do their best, but we need media megaphones. It does seem to me there's a very big one, in fact, quite a few, arguing the tough on crime so-called line. Do you want to reflect on the media here for a bit? Sure. The, the media, I would say, um, in the aggregate, has been absolutely terrible on on, on these issues. Um you know, at, at the far extreme, the New York Post is a is a Rupert Murdoch owned tabloid that um, I think it's fair to say has a political agenda in in pushing the narratives of of fear and and the crime scare. Um, but but it's not limited to that. You know, other other tabloids and newspapers, and especially local TV news, are are extremely invested in news cycles that uh, that revolve around. Um, frightening anecdotal incidents of crime that that's just something that that collects eyeballs it's it's um it's good for the business model um even if it's not reflective of reality or or good for society i just want to point out how impactful it is and you can go back and listen to yourself the governor in when discussing bail reform said she was responding to uh headlines that she saw in the media that's incredible that is incredible that you would say that out loud. Instead of looking at the evidence, looking at the data, and helping our state figure out how best we should move forward, we're looking at headlines like the New York Post, as salacious as they want to be, to help move us in a direction that we know is harmful, even though the data says something else. And I think people will be people do not believe that New York City is actually one of the safest big cities in this country right now. They wouldn't believe it, but it's true. Well, I close these conversations usually by asking my guests what they think the story will be that the future tells of this moment. And I know that, you, that this is a frustrating story, but maybe the arc is, in fact, tilting in the right direction. Um, Nick, starting with you, what do you think is the story the future will tell? And if you have to go forward 50 years, go for it. Yeah, I. It, it, it's hard for me to... Um draw a great deal of optimism for the near foreseeable future but but um i i suppose uh that that in some distant date when when um people have changed the way they think about uh crime and punishment and and what constitutes a, a healthy community um they will they will look back at this time in horror and dismay I'm not sure how we get from here to there. I'm not sure what the future generation will say. I think they may be dismayed, hopefully, once they get it right, of how long it took and the moral blight that stained our community. But I also, I always often say, um, I often say that the, the future is looking at us. Our children are looking at us, uh, who are unborn, saying, don't forget about us. Uh, please remember us and decisions that, that we're making. And, and sometimes I don't know that we are thinking of them. Well, thank you both. It's been a challenging conversation. Thank you for your work on the story, and uh, we'll continue to follow it. Thank you. Peace and blessings, everyone. Thank you. What's going to break the logjam around closing Rikers Jail? Well, maybe stirring up a little East Coast, West Coast competition would help. After all, there's nothing New Yorkers like less than being ill-favorably compared to Californians. But just look at what's coming out of the leadership of California versus the mayor's office on this issue of criminal justice reform and decarceration. From Governor Gavin Newsom, a $20 million bold plan to transform infamous San Quentin prison into a kind of Norwegian-style rehabilitation center set, as he puts it, on breaking the cycles of crime. Out of Mayor Adams' office, a miserly budget cut in this year's budget. Mayor Adams proposes saving $17 million by cutting the contracts with the service providers who've been offering Rikers detainees rehab classes and help finding housing and getting off drugs. Is that any kind of a way to stir up excitement about transformation in the prison system in New York, Mayor Adams? I don't think so. Let's face it, maybe Governor Newsom's plan will find lots of devils in the details, but at least it's a vision people can get excited about. One of the reasons people aren't excited about closing Rikers 
is that it looks like instead of a new plan, there are simply a transition to many Rikers in people's backyards. What we need is more, bolder vision. And those visions are out there in this area. What they need is more attention, and more attention today, with the voices of former detainees being heard. We'll be following the story as it develops. In the meantime, stay kind, stay curious, and if you want to hear the full version of today's conversation, Sans Cuts, subscribe to our free podcast or the information's at our website. Till the next time, for The Laura Flanders Show, I'm Laura. Thanks for joining me. For more on this episode and other forward-thinking content, subscribe to our free newsletter for updates, my commentaries, and our full uncut conversations. We also have a podcast. It's all at lauraflanders.org.